in this week's YouTube video, I've got 10 fast actions that you can take that will really improve your watercolour painting. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour, lots of drawing tutorials, mixed media, even some business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing, it's completely free, it's a great way of supporting the channel. And if you'd like to support the channel further, you can also click the join button and find out more about how to get extra content all about colour mixing. So this week I'm going to give you 10 fast actions that you can take that will really, really lead to big improvements in your watercolour paintings. Now when I say fast actions, I don't mean that these are things that take no time at all. I just mean that these are things that will really level up your painting skills quickly and lead to you getting to where you want to be and getting much better, much more consistent results a lot quicker than you would otherwise get. So let's go through these 10 actions that you can take. The best thing about them is none of them require any actual talent. For some of them, I'll be pointing the camera down at my desk and demonstrating. And some of them I just need to tell you about. So let's get started with tip number one. So the first action that you can take that will really, really level up and improve your watercolour paintings is to learn to draw. And before you say, oh, well, that takes ages, Michelle, and I don't want to do that, then let me explain a couple of things that might just change your mind. So first of all, you don't have to learn all drawing today or before you do your next painting. Learning to draw is a process. Improvement is gradual. So you want to get yourself out of this mindset of I can't draw or I don't want to learn to draw. Or, Learning to draw takes ages because every tiny, tiny step that you take in improving your drawing will improve your painting. Now, why is this important? Because painting and drawing are not separate things, they're all part of the same thing, which is creating art. So it's the idea of getting what's in your head out onto the paper. Now, drawing teaches you manual dexterity. It teaches the ability to use a tool, to manipulate that tool and to get the object or the image that's in your brain down and onto the paper. So when you're painting, you're going through the exact same process. It is, if you like, drawing with a brush. So of course you can trace a drawing and then you can put paint on it, but that's not going to teach you how to manipulate your brush, how to have that manual dexterity and how to get that process working whereby the image that you have in your head or that you can see in front of you is transferred accurately to your paper. Now at the end of this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link up to my 20 fast drawing tips. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, learning to draw takes ages, you can watch a short video that's going to give you 20 really useful practical tips that you can implement today that will improve your drawing and therefore will improve your paintings. Tip number two is to stretch your paper. Now, before you groan and say, oh, I don't want to do that, it takes ages, it really doesn't. I can stretch a sheet of paper in less time than it takes me to make a cup of tea. And being British, I'm super fast at making tea. Now, there are alternatives. You can use a watercolour block, which is a pad of watercolour paper that's been gummed all the way around the edge. And that will prevent some of the buckling, they call it cockling, of your paper. And it's going to give you a flatter surface to paint on. So why is this important? It's not just important aesthetically that your painting dries flat. It's actually important because it helps you to control water levels. We'll talk more about that later. But just know that the flatter the paper stays while you're painting on it, the better your results are going to be, the easier it's going to be to paint on. And that's a huge win for just a few minutes input. I'll link to my video in the description of this video that shows you exactly how to stretch paper. Now, somebody went into YouTube comments this week and said, well, I like this paper stretching video, but I actually prefer to staple my paper rather than tape it. That is perfectly valid. This is something that you can do. You can also buy contraptions that will stretch the paper for you. Or as I said, you can use a watercolour block, but please don't be painting on unprepared paper. It's so much easier and indeed cheaper actually, because you can use thinner paper to stretch your paper first. Don't forget to go in the video description at the end of this video so that you can learn how to do it faster than making a cup of tea. My next tip is to use quality materials. Now, of course, it doesn't matter if you have a proper water container, you can just use a jam jar. It doesn't matter if you have a proper palette, you could use a plate. But there are three items that it does matter. that You have at least a decent quality, and that is your paper, your paints and your brushes. Now, you do not need to have top quality. Indeed, I would advise you if you are a very beginner, you're going to mess up a lot of paintings, not to buy the very best quality. Because I see it all the time, people saying, well, you must use Arsh's watercolour paper. Oh, I don't use anything but Daniel Smith. Your paintbrush must come from the towel feathers of the phoenix, or at least Kalinsky sable. Now, all of these things that are being recommended are, of course, good quality. 
Though I myself would never use a Kalinsky sable brush because I don't believe that animals should die just so that I can make a painting. So try to avoid this holy grail thinking of there's only one brand of paper or one brand of paints that's good. Because the truth is there are many good brands of paint and many good brands of paper. What you do want to avoid though are these very cheap, unnamed sort of drugstore papers. Or here in the UK we would call it stationery shops. The kind of shops where you can go in and you can buy art materials and a desk lamp and some cushions and a new mug and some dog food. Because often the brands in those places are not very good so do familiarise yourself with some good brands. It's absolutely fine to start with students quality. And controversially, I would even say that if you're starting out, a wood pulp paper is fine, but you will need to stretch it and you will need to understand that you can't scrub at it too many times because it will start to lift. But in the past, when I was asked to demonstrate for brands, I've done gallery ready work just using wood pulp paper. As I said, don't use the very cheapest stuff. Some of it really only is good enough for wiping your backside on in the toilet. But you want to get good brands, buying in bulk or buying on the internet, depending where you live in the world, may or may not be cheaper for you. Particularly when it comes to paper, it's often cheaper to buy large batches and cut it down to size than it is to buy a pad of paper where you can be paying even three or four times the price. Now, as I said, this does vary from country to country. Some people have told me that in their country this is not the case. So don't shoot me in the comments. But do be aware that using a decent quality, at least a student's quality at least, is going to really improve your painting skills. So if you're just starting out, you don't need the very best. You don't need paper that was made in the French Alps from spring water and transported by unicorns. But you do need a good, at least student's quality brand. It's going to really help you to get good results. The next fast action that you can take is to swatch your paint colours. You'd be amazed how many art classes I've taught and I've gone around and somebody's looking often at sort of pan paints and they're peering in there and saying, well, I don't know what this colour here is. I've not really used it. It's quite dark. I'm not sure what it is. It's really important that you get to know your materials. And the first thing you should do is swatch your colours. Now, swatching doesn't just tell you what hue a paint is. It can also tell you things about transparency, about granulation. There's more than one way to swatch. I recently made a video for my Colour Academy members all about five different ways of making swatches. If you're interested in that, do click the join button below this video. But meantime, let me show you one of the easiest and smallest ways that you can make a sample that will tell you the most about the colours that you own. So there are lots of ways of making swatches, but I'm going to show you one here that really covers a lot of bases. So I've drawn an oblong shape and you can see it's got a black line in the centre. Now that's a permanent marker. You can use any kind of black permanent pen. Make sure that it's a reasonable width though. You know, don't have it the width of a, a rabbit hair because you just won't be able to see the results. And that's going to be to show us how opaque the paint is. So what we want to do on this swatch is we want to go from very dark down to very light. That's going to show us what the colour looks like with all different levels of water. And then after it dries, because you can't tell while it's still wet, but after it dries, you'll be able to look at this black line and you'll find with certain colours, it appears really quite clear still. But then other colours, it's going to go kind of murky and misty. And that's going to show you that that paint has some opacity. Now, there's nothing wrong with semi-opaque watercolours. Certain colours just naturally, because of the pigments they're made from, do tend to be a little bit more opaque. It just gives you a bit of extra information you can use for your decision making process. And whether you want a colour that's clearer or a colour that's more opaque is going to depend on the subject and what you're painting at the time. So let's start and make this swatch. Now it's quite hard to start with paint and then put more and more water in and get anywhere near to white paper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by sticking some clean water up one end. I've got a little bit of tissue paper off to the side so I can mop my brush a bit so that it's not too puddly here. We don't want to puddle. I'm going to swatch this colour here, which is permanent rose. It's quite a transparent colour. I'm going to start here and start really nice and strong. And then depending on how strong the colour is, depends on whether you need to just add a little bit of water or completely clean your brush. This is a strong colour, so I'm going to completely rinse my brush. And then with a brush that's damp, but not dripping wet, I'm going to start to spread the colour along. I might here rinse my brush again and then I'm going to join up with that area of water. Now a swatch like this can take a little bit of practice so have a go on some scraps before you make yourself a nice colour chart 
And do remember that the point of a swatch is that it shows you what the color is and what the properties of the color are. You'll also be able to see in this part here how granular it is if you've got any little speckles which would indicate a granulating color. But the point of a color swatch is not to look immaculate. And I assure you, if you draw a page of these, sooner or later you're gonna mess one up, you're gonna paint one in the wrong box, you're gonna go outside the lines, but try not to worry about it. The whole point is to inform yourself about the color. Once it's completely dry, you'll be able to see how sharp this line is. With this color here, I would expect it to be fairly sharp. With another color, say this yellow ochre here, I would expect that line to have gone quite cloudy. If you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, can I ask you please to click the like button, to click that thumbs up. If you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, it helps YouTube to push this video out to more people. Basically gives YouTube a signal that this is a good video. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. And let's get back now to another action that you can take to improve your watercolors. Now the next fast action that you can take to improve your watercolor paintings will be to make yourself some color charts. Now, at the very minimum, you should know what happens to each color when you mix it with another one of the colors that you own. I'm going to show you in a moment how to make that chart. So we've already swatched to see what our colors actually look like. Now we need to mix them with other colors. And whether you're someone like me who color mixing comes quite naturally to, or whether you're a complete beginner and you've no idea about color mixing, color charts are the best place to start. Because if you're quite good at choosing and mixing colors, you're going to find that that's just going to cement your knowledge or at least start you on the path where you end up so you don't need the color chart as much. And if you never get to that stage, if color is just not your thing, then you have a guide that you can refer to time and time again to help you to mix from. Let me show you some of my own color charts. So you're looking at a color chart here that I made when I first started painting, and this is a secondary color chart. In other words, I've taken blues and I've taken yellows and mixed them together. So all of the blues and all of the yellows that I owned at the time, and I have mixed them together to get a selection of greens. So down here we have the blues, across the top we have the yellows. Now within each of these colors, you could get many, many other colors. For example, I could use more or less water leading to a darker or a lighter color, but equally I could use more of the yellow or more of the blue leading to a more bluish green or a more bright yellow green. So this is just a starting point, but a color chart like this gives you some real good information. It tells you what sort of green you get when you mix two of your colors together. Look here at the ceruleans, they're all quite granulating, as are these ultramarines. The cobalts are rather more opaque and smoother. The Prussians here are strong and clear. And the same with the yellows. We can see the effect of using a bright lemon yellow and then going up to more medium yellows and then going up here to our warm yellow ochre where we start to get very muddy, very warm colors. So there are three secondary colors. So I did another similar color chart to this with my yellows and reds to make oranges, another with my reds and blues to make purples. So those are great charts to make. But if you don't have that many colors, you could equally just put all of your colors on one color chart, literally going through every color you have down here, every color you have across the top, and then match them up and see what you get. That's a great way of having a chart that you can put on your wall or keep in a binder that will tell you exactly what happens when you mix one color with another. So here you can see I did the same with my purples and I've got them in this plastic sheeting here so that I can have them near me when I'm painting and I don't have to worry about paint splashes. There are many, many different types of color charts that you can make. So you need to choose the sort of color chart that's gonna be helpful to you, whether that's just one chart with all your colors on, charts for secondary colors like this, I even used to keep a random page in the back where if I mixed a color and I just sort of liked that color, you know, maybe I mixed cobalt blue with Venetian red and I thought, oh, that's an interesting sort of color. I just made a little bit of a swatch of it and wrote those two colors next to it. It was a great record of a color that I had invented. I don't do that as much nowadays because I'm a bit more experienced in color mixing. But the good thing about color charts is that even if you're not great at color mixing, you always have a record of what happens when you mix one color with another. The next action you need to take is to use the right brush. Now there are dozens and dozens of different shapes of watercolor painting brushes. It can be very confusing. There's only really two that you need to start with. Not only is it important to know which these two are, but it's also important to use the right size. Let me explain what you need. 
So let's look at brushes. Now I have made more videos about brushes going into more detail of my favorite types of watercolor brushes because you'll see so many different types of brushes. You'll see rigger brushes and fan brushes and flat brushes and angled flat brushes. It seems to me being rather cynical that they invent a new brush shape every single year and tell you that you can't live without this particular brush shape. But all you really need to start with is a brush like this. So this is a fairly large round brush. Though it's got a point at the end, it's called a round brush. I also like to keep a slightly smaller one. Point's gone off this one a bit because it's a little bit old. These are synthetic brushes. Um, if you see this one says Sable, it's just because it was a manufacturer's sample. It's not Sable, it's synthetic. And then I've got a large flat brush like this. This is going to enable me both to apply water to my paper and also to do things like large flat washes where I can sweep across and work quickly. That's really important in watercolor painting because as soon as your paint starts to dry and you have a wet area next to a dry area, we're gonna talk more about that in a moment, you're gonna get into trouble. So if we take a shape like this, the biggest mistake you can make is to try and paint this shape with a tiny, tiny brush like this one here. Because what's gonna happen is it's gonna take you too long. A brush like this doesn't hold much water. And so what's gonna happen is it's gonna to start to dry and you're gonna end up getting drying lines just because you're taking way too long. So what you need to do with brushes is use the largest brush that you can manage to wield for that particular situation. Now, is there ever a need for using a really tiny brush like the one I've just showed you? Well, yes, there is. If you're painting maybe a person and you want to paint eyelashes or some tiny details on an animal or a butterfly, there may be an occasion where you need to use a tiny brush like that. But bear in mind that if you have a good brush like this one and it's got a point, you can do some really, really fine details with it. So the rule is the largest brush possible. I do have my own set of three brushes made by Jackmans here in the UK. If you're interested in those, you can have a look at them via the link in the video description. So you've swatched your colors, you've got your materials, you've chosen the right brush, everything's ready to go. Now, the most important thing about actually applying the paint is understanding water levels, because you may have noticed that watercolor continues to develop after you've applied it to the paper. It can run, it can bleed, it can move. There are a few basics that you need to know and there are a few basic sample swatches that you should make. A few techniques if you like, such as a flat wash and a blended edge. These are things that it's really important for you to get right. So I'm going to show you now why water levels are important. I do have other videos on this subject that go into this a little bit more in depth. I'll link to those in the description of this video. And if you really need a lot of help with basic watercolor techniques, I have a whole course available for you. That one is a paid course, but I'll link to that as well in the description of this video in case that's something that interests you. So let's look at water levels and why they're so important. So as I said, I have lots more resources for learning how to control water, but briefly there are a few basic techniques that you need to understand and that you need to practice and learn before you throw yourself into a really large painting. The first one is a flat wash. So all that means is to put some paint across an area of paper in an even manner so that no areas are particularly light or dark and so that you don't have any drying lines. I have a whole video on how to do this technique. It's important that you don't leave puddles. You see, I've just dried my brush there and I'm using that to pick up any excess paint now, of course, you'll still see some variation in color and particularly with granulating colors, you may see little speckles, but the whole point is to apply an area of paint smoothly and evenly. The next thing you need to learn is how to fade out an edge. We can do this like we did with our swatch by applying some clean water and painting next to it. Or we can do this by applying paint first onto dry paper and then using a damp brush to blend out the edge. The first method is definitely more easy, but if you can, you should master both because there are various situations where you need to do it either way. Next technique you need to learn is how to blend two colors on the paper in a really pretty wet into wet technique. that allows colors to blend together but without over mixing so that you just get one big pile of mud. And one of the main things to understand is that if you paint wet paint 
on or next to an area of damp paint, it is going to spread like this. Well, that's pretty, isn't it? You can make some cool effects. But if you were trying to get a clean line, for instance, down here, it wouldn't be very good. So you would need to allow the original color to dry first. Try practicing some of these techniques yourself. If you do have trouble with them, check out the video description for more resources. So the next simple action that you can take to really level up your watercolor painting is to use a limited palette. I'm not talking about how many colors you actually own. I'm talking about how many you use per painting. Now there's no right amount for this. Something like a sunset may only need three or four colors. Something like a garden painting might need 20. But the more you can keep your palette of colors per painting in a limited range, the more of an overall atmosphere or mood your painting will have. Often this is the difference between professional paintings and amateur paintings. This is something you need to be especially disciplined with if you use pan paints, if you have a set of block paints, because you'll be inclined just to dip in and out of random colors. I'm gonna show you one of my own paintings now and the colors I chose and how I keep track of what I'm using. Now, please don't think of this technique as being limiting. It really isn't. You can have and own and use as many colors as you want, I just want you to restrict them within each painting. So I've got my camera quite low today, so you're quite zoomed in on this large painting of mine, and you can see that it's a sunset. If I lift it up the base, you'll be able to see the colors down there and the colors in the top here. You see that it's got a certain look to it. It's not a particularly orange sunset. Indeed, it's only got some pale yellows and some pale purples. Now, if I move the painting across so that you can see the edge of the tape, you can see here where I wrote my colors down. Now I used quinacridone gold. I used manganese blue hue, which is a Daniel Smith color. And I believe the quinacridone gold is also Daniel Smith. I used quinacridone magenta. I believe the one I have is by Jackman's Art Materials. And I used indigo. I've got a feeling that's a Windsor and Newton color. So look at this. This whole painting was done from just four colors. So what can we say about these four colors? Now they follow a very standard starting point that I would use for many paintings, which is three primaries and a staining color. So for our red or pink, we've got the quinacridone magenta. For our yellow, we've got the quinacridone gold. For our blue, we've got the manganese blue hue, which is a color that's much like cerulean, but brighter. And lastly, we've got indigo. Now, indigo was the color I chose to be my staining color, and it's really important to have at least one very strong dark color in your painting. So you can see here how much more lively this sunset tree looks than if I just grabbed some black from my palette. You can be quite instinctive at choosing your colors. You don't need any specialist knowledge. Just swatch one or two colors. See if you like the look of them. Make sure you've got at least the three primaries, at least one staining or strong color and a few other colors if you feel that you need them. And as you go through the painting, you can always add another one. A limited palette is there to help you, not to handcuff you. So if you get halfway through and there's a color you feel you need and you really can't mix, don't be afraid to bring in one more. The whole idea though is to give your painting a certain look, a certain atmosphere. I could have done this same painting with four entirely different colors and got a completely different look. It might still have been very lovely. It just would have had a completely different atmosphere. One of the best and indeed the quickest actions that you can take to improve your watercolors is to work cleanly. So that's not only within your palette. And one of the things that I like to do if I've been using paints that I've squeezed out or perhaps paints that are squeezed out and dried, I like to clean my mixing palettes at the end of each painting. It's just sort of an end point. We all get in a mess, of course, while we're painting, but if you can clean up at the end, that's really great because it means that you're starting your next painting with all your new colors and you're not getting a load of palette mud from the painting before. Another thing that's really important is to change your water frequently, to use more than one water jar. I'll explain about that in a moment. And also to understand about color opposites. I've often walked around a class of students and a student has said to me, Michelle, my colors, you know, my painting, it just doesn't look very clean. I've got muddy colors again. I don't know what's going wrong. And when I look at their jar of water, it looks like soup or hot chocolate. And I'm sort of looking at, you know, the painting and the jar of water thing. Mm, can't imagine what could possibly have caused this lack of clarity in your colors. It's not just as simple as using clean water. There are a few strategies to consider. Let me show you why it's important and why color opposites will tell you when it's time to change your water. So while I'm working here, I actually have two water jars. Somebody gave me these very large plastic containers. They're rather nice, aren't they? I think they came from some kind of factory. 
And I've got an ordinary size water jar. I always keep at least two water jars on the go. That's so that I can have one where I initially dip my paintbrush in for dirty water. And then I have one where I've got clean water if I need to do something like a blended edge. I've also got my palette here. This is just one of many that I own. You can see that it's got a bit of muck in it. There's some dirty paint in this well here. I would make sure that every time I finish a painting, I clean this up. So let's think about when you need to change your water. And some people actually use that two water jars method, but they have one water jar for rinsing cool colors in and another for warm colors. That isn't the way I prefer to do it, but there's nothing wrong with doing it that way if you think it's helpful to you. But one thing that's going to tell you about when to change your water or when to be more careful with where you're mixing on your palette is this idea of color opposites. So there are only three sets of color opposites, sometimes called complementary colors. We have red and green, we have blue and orange, and we have yellow and purple. Even if you can't remember those, it doesn't really matter. Just remember that if you're going to a color that's completely different to the first color, then you're going to need to change your water. So let's think about if I was painting with a light green and here's my light green. Now, if I then went on to painting with some blue, actually it wouldn't be disastrous using the same water to rinse the paintbrush in because blue is part of green. There is a harmony between these colors. However, what if the next color after the green I was going to go into was this bright pink? And although there's some difference between pink and red, in terms of color mixing, you can sort of lump them together somewhat in your mind. Now, what happens when we mix pink with green? We're going to end up with very, very dull colors. Let's get some more green here, mix these together. And eventually we're going to end up with this very muddy color, which could be useful for something, but you don't want to mix it by accident. So what's going on here? What's going on is we're ending up mixing all three primaries together. So why do I say that? So with the green, we have yellow and blue because it's made from yellow and blue. And then the pink is our third primary. Mix those together and you will get either brown or gray. If you have a lot of blue in the mix, you'll get a gray. If you have more red and yellow, then you will get a brown. So you see where these two colors have blended together. It still looks clear and fresh because blue is part of green. But where we end up mixing the pink and the green together, we just end up with a load of dullness. And this doesn't just apply to mixing on the paper, it applies to your palette and it applies to your water. So if you're going to go to color opposites or a color that's very different to the one you're mixing from, then always change your water and always make sure you're mixing in a clean well of your palette. Mixed colors like this certainly have a use in painting, but you want to be making them on purpose, not just accidentally dulling down your beautiful fresh colors. Now, an example of an action that takes time up but will save you immense amounts of time is to research and test. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is that rather than just throwing yourself into painting something that you've no idea how to paint, you should spend some time watching or listening to or reading tutorials and also testing out the techniques before you put them on the paper. So I'm gonna give you a little example in a moment, but let's think about a real life situation. Now, say you were going to paint some rocks. You had a painting that had some rocks in the foreground, there was a mottled texture to them. They were quite dark. There was also sort of lichen and things growing on them. And you really didn't have any clue how to attack this with your paintbrush. What I would suggest is that you go and watch some tutorials. Now I say watch, now some people learn better by reading books, but since you're watching a YouTube video here, I'm guessing that you're pretty okay with watching tutorials. And they're really, for me, there's nothing like actually seeing someone else do the painting. You shouldn't just watch one tutorial either because I doubt, that mine is the only channel you watch. No doubt you have your favorite YouTubers and each of them would probably approach painting rocks quite differently. And only one of these techniques might be suitable for you or for your particular situation. There might be one that just resonates with you more than others. And so the first thing you want to do, rather than just throw yourself into a painting and have a high chance of failure because you don't quite know how to paint these rocks, the first thing you want to do is to look for and watch some tutorials. Next thing you want to do is to grab some scrap watercolor paper and start practicing those techniques. So if you've watched my channel for a while, you'll know I'm a big advocate of scraps of paper and actually testing things out, not only testing out techniques, but also testing out colors before you go to the stage of placing them on your paper. It just gives you so much of a greater chance of success. 
I know you want to get on with the painting, but that 20 minutes or so of research and testing could save you the loss of the entire painting. If that painting took you four hours, then that's four hours you're not getting back, that you could have avoided losing just by spending 20 minutes on research and testing. Because watercolour is a little bit different from other mediums, and it's often necessary to use some kind of texture technique or mixed media technique in order to get the effect that you're looking for. And sometimes these techniques are a bit all or nothing. Once you've put them on your paper, you can't take them off. Let me show you an example. So let's say I just watched a video tutorial because I wanted to get some sparkle on water and I was actually painting a sunset. So I wanted to get the orange light sparkling on the water. And the tutorial told me that I could do this with oil pastel. And yes, I do have a full tutorial on how to paint a sunset like this. So I'm gonna apply my oil pastel. I'm gonna use an old brush because sometimes a little bit of pastel comes up. And I'm going to apply my paint. Now, as it turns out, I'm quite happy with this effect, but it may be that once I've applied this particular blue, I think to myself, mm, actually, I'd like that color to be a bit brighter. Perhaps I'd be better using a yellow. So let's try something a little bit brighter. Hmm, I'm not sure about that one. It's gone rather green, which is probably an optical illusion because the blue is so close to it, or maybe a little bit of the blue paint is sitting on top of the yellow. But with either one of these samples, I can't get this oil pastel off the paper. So it's really important to me that I try this out first before I put it on my paper. I might decide I want to try a third color. I might decide that actually this phthalo blue is too bright and too dark. I might decide to try a lighter, softer blue. Perhaps that'll give me more of the effect that I want. But the main thing is that I'm not just gonna grab my painting and randomly go in with a technique that I haven't tried, with a color I haven't tried. As the paint dries, you see it's starting to get lighter. So I'll also need to let this dry to see the full effect. I can't really tell how the finished effect is going to look whilst it's still wet. But the most important thing is that I've tried this technique out. It's like a car, I don't have to drive off the pier. I can put it into reverse and change course and head in a different direction. Now the concepts we've talked about today are very broad. I do have some more detailed videos all about the stuff that we've talked about today. I'll list those in the description of this video. While you're down there, don't forget to grab some of those free downloadable PDF guides that I have for you. There's even a free watercolor painting course that you can take for no money whatsoever. And if you need some extra help with your watercolor painting or your drawing, don't forget to check out my Thinkific courses whereby I take you through all of the basic skills you need step by step in far more detail than I'm ever able to go into here on YouTube. You can also join my Color Mixing Academy. It's only around $10 US per month. You'll get an extra video every week all about color mixing. If you click the join button below, it'll tell you more about that. Don't worry, you're not agreeing to anything by clicking join. Some options will come up and you'll be able to choose. Meantime, don't forget what I said at the beginning of this video, drawing is important to painting. You can watch my 20 fast drawing tips video right now.